But we're going to read from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3. I'm going to be reading from the contemporary English version, um, but any version of the Bible you have is going to be fine. 1 Samuel chapter 3 verses 1 through 10. Samuel served the Lord by helping Eli the priest, who was by that time almost blind. In those days, the Lord hardly spoke to peop- directly to people, and he didn't appear to them in dreams very often. But one night, Eli was sleeping in his room, and Samuel was sleeping on a mat near the sacred chest, or that is the Ark of the Covenant, when the Lord cried out and called Samuel's name. Here I am, Samuel answered. And then he ran to Eli and said, here I am, what do you want? I didn't call you, Eli said. He's like, go back to bed. So Samuel went back. Again, the Lord cried out Samuel's name and Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am, what do you want? Eli's like, son, I did not call you, go back to bed. The Lord had not spoken to Samuel before and Samuel didn't recognize the voice. So when God called out a third time, Samuel went to Eli and he's like, here I am. What do you want? Eli finally realized that it must have been the Lord that was speaking to Samuel. And so he said to him, go back and lie down. And if someone speaks to you again, answer, I'm listening, Lord. What do you want me to do? So once again, Samuel went and laid down. And then the Lord stood beside Samuel and called out, as he had done every time before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, I'm listening. What do you want me to do? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for a great opportunity this morning to read your word, to study your word, and to glean something from it for our lives, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the incredible testimony of Ray, Lord, and how, pow- how powerfully you worked in his life when you called his name and he responded, Lord. Father, I pray right now that we will respond to your call. We will respond to your word and to your voice. Open our minds, open our ears, and open our hearts to hear you and to understand you, Lord God, that we may, be, that we may respond and live our lives according to your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last year, I was living in Brookwater by myself. And when, when you move somewhere new, there's all different sounds. So you get used to the sounds that are around your house and you can live next to a highway and it doesn't bother you. You can live next to a, a train track and the trains hurtling past it. They, they don't annoy you because you grow accustomed to it and you choose to tune it out. But when you move to a new place, you may have been living next to a you know, train line, but you move to a quiet place and you hear the birds cheeping, you're like, what is that noise? Anyway, so I was living in Brookwater and I came home one afternoon uh, after shopping and was just pottering around the house. It was a pretty average kind, of, I think it was a Saturday afternoon. It was pretty normal for, you know, The Secret Garden was on TV, that movie, and that was playing in the background, and I was just doing my thing. And then I heard a noise, a noise from upstairs. And I had grown accustomed to the noises around the house, but this noise was different. It sounded like the sound of a door opening and closing. I live by myself. That's kind of scary when you hear a door open and close, and you're supposed to be the only one in the house. So I'm like frozen stiff and my ears like tune into every little noise that's going on around the place. I've turned the TV noise down so that isn't a distraction and I'm like just frozen there. After a couple of minutes, I'm like, okay, well, I have to go investigate this. So I go to the kitchen and I grab a Stay Sharp knife. (laughs) What on earth I was going to do with that knife, I have no idea, but I grabbed it and I went upstairs to investigate And I checked each of the rooms, and there was nobody or anything in each of those rooms. Except one of the rooms, there was a sliding door on it that went out onto a balcony, and that door was unlocked. Well, of course, by this stage, my heart is like pounding out of my chest. But there was nothing there, and so I went back downstairs again, and I went outside just to have a look around to see if there was any movement Well, by coincidence, a car speeds down the road at the same time I walk out of the house. And so I'm like, (gasps) doesn't do much for your anxiety levels, let me tell you. But there was nothing. I went back inside and I couldn't see that anything had been taken or anything had been moved. 
And so I just put it down to paranoia. I went to bed that night. I replaced the knife. The knife went back into the block. And I went, I went to bed that night. And I'm laying in my bed and, you know, just about to fall asleep. And I hear this crash outside what seems to be my bedroom window. And, of course, that I'm up. I'm up. I've had enough that night. I go straight to the kitchen. I grab a knife. I grab... Same knife. I grab my car keys and I go outside. I'm going to check this thing out and I, I'm going to hunt down whatever that was. Can't see anything. Can't see anything. Everything was peaceful and quiet as the neighbourhood usually is. So I go back inside and I check everything inside. All the doors and windows are locked. And I return to bed. Keys in my pillowcase, knife under my pillow. <laughs> Nothing's going to get to me. Don't wake me up in the middle of the night and scare me. That's all I'm saying to anybody. Well, the next morning I woke up after, you know, a restless sleep when you've got that much adrenaline pumping through your system. And I did another perimeter of the house just to check. Well, I found that there was a hairspray can that had fallen off the vanity in the bathroom in my ensuite right next to my bedroom onto the tiles which had caused the big crash from the night before. See, Samuel heard noises in the night. And fortunately for me and, you know, more to his favour, he had a more rational response to hearing his name being called in the night. He didn't pick up a knife. He went to Eli, the other person who was sleeping in the house that night. But it wasn't Eli. So the question remains, how do you respond when the rational response isn't the right one? How do you respond to a voice that isn't Eli calling you? You see, in those days, the Lord hardly spoke to anyone. And he didn't really appear to dreams very often either. When we read through this passage, there are a few things that we can glean from it and I believe apply to our lives. And the first one is that God's call is personal. God was speaking. It wasn't a crash of a hairspray can. It was the Lord's voice speaking to Samuel. You see in Isaiah 43 verse 1 it says, But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. And Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart to be a prophet to the nations. You see, we're not carbon copies of each other, but rather we're unique pieces of craftsmanship. The Bible is very clear that God knows our names. He knows the number of hair that is on our heads. He knows us intimately and he knows us deeply. And he calls our name. Nothing grabs your attention like hearing your name being called. It's like it's so personal, so ingrained in us. It's like this tug. And so you can be in a crowd of people and so much noise going on, yet you you think you hear your name or you hear your name and there's like this automatic response to turn to it. And you, you kind of have to be consciously aware to ignore that voice. Because as soon as I hear Tess, I'm like, what? I hear the word Jess and I turn around because it's very close to my name. Nothing grabs you like the sound of your own name. It's personal. And God didn't call Samuel by saying, hey, you. No, he knew Samuel. He formed Samuel before he was in, even in his mother's womb. He claimed him. Samuel was his, and he knew his name, and he called that name. See, God's call is incredibly personal. And you know what? God is no respecter of persons or of earthly qualifications. If anyone in that house should have been the one hearing from God, it should have been Eli. Eli was the priest. He was the mediator between God and his people. He was the one who was supposed to be able to hear from God and then instruct people in what to do about it. Yet God didn't call Eli, God called Samuel. You see, Samuel was probably about 12 or 13 at this time. He'd never heard God's voice before, yet God chose to call him. See, the only qualification 
that the Bible says about receiving from God and communicating from God is it says, he who has ears, let him hear. That's any single one of us who has ears. Let us hear the voice of God. You see, in those days, God didn't speak to people very often. And I think a lot of us, like Ray, kind of, you know, throw up our hands and ask the question, well, God, if you are real, then why don't you just tell us and why don't you just show us and let's just be done with this debate? Plenty of us, I think, have asked that and plenty of us may have even had people ask that question of us as well. See, the thing is, God's voice isn't always heard and it's not always recognised. You know, sometimes when you're busy and you're really focused on a project, and I can, I'm a bit task orientated, so I can get, you know, a bit tunnel visioned. And so I'll be totally engrossed in something, you know, a situation in my life or a puzzle that I'm doing, something along those lines. And then all of a sudden you hear like your name being screamed at you. And you're like, what on earth? Like, why are you screaming at me? only to be told by the person who's screaming that they've actually been calling your name now for about five to ten minutes and there's been no response. And so it just escalates, the, vo- the volume just escalates from that point. Perhaps it's not that God hasn't been speaking. Perhaps it's not that God hasn't been calling our name but rather we're too busy in our current circumstance or our current project to hear him. Or perhaps a bit like Samuel, we've never heard the voice of God before and so have no idea how to recognize it and identify it as God's voice. Could it be that God has been calling us the whole time? The Lord had not spoken to Samuel before and Samuel didn't recognize his voice. You know, Samuel responded logically. The first the second and the third time. The thing was, is that it was the incorrect response. Samuel had never heard the voice of God. He couldn't recognize it. And so he did the logical thing, which was to think, okay, well, who else is in the house? All right, who would be most likely to be calling my name? I'll go to them. And of course it was Eli. Samuel was there serving the Lord by helping Eli. Eli, would have been, Eli was an old man. He was almost blind at that time. So being called in the middle of the night to help with something, I'm sure probably wasn't an abnormal occurrence for Samuel. But it was this night. And so his response to go to Eli was an incorrect response. Now, we talk about the voice of God right now, and I think it's important to clarify that the voice of God, and God doesn't just speak in English as his primary language, even though it may be our primary language. You see, in communication, they say that only 10% of what is said is actually the verbal words that are spoken. The rest of the 90% is made up of body language and of tone of voice. So it's actually not words that are doing the communicating. Perhaps God is a bit like that. I believe that he is. That it's not just spoken words, but rather a tone of voice that can be heard or body language, a signal. See, God speaks through creation. He can speak through circumstance. He can speak through a sight, a smell, a touch, a sound. He can speak through a feeling. So when we're we're listening and when we're trying to pay attention to God's voice and we're trying to recognize it, it may not always be that audible test that's being called. It may not be that audible voice, but perhaps it could be the the sight of a sunset. It could be the sight of the vista from a mountaintop. It could be the smell of a perfume. It could be the taste of coffee. Who knows what it could be for you, but I believe God's call, as we said before, God's call is personal and it will be as unique and as specific as you are, as your very DNA is. You see, his fourth response was brave and it was courageous. And some may say that it was one of faith because he had no idea what that response was going to mean. 
he finally was told that the voice that was calling his name, that thing that had been tugging at him during the night, was God. And he'd been told how to respond, but he had no idea where that would go. You know, us as humans, we have been called by God. And Jesus Christ is his greatest expression and communication of his love for each and every one of us. But how do we respond to that? Well, Romans chapter 10 verses 9 to 13 has an answer. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and that you are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, that could be the religious and unreligious people. The same Lord is Lord of all and blesses richly all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, it's not about having a perfect answer. When I read through that passage of scripture, it says that to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and to believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, that he sent his son to die for us and that he raised him again. If you believe that and you can confess that, then you are saved. For Samuel, his response was simply, I'm listening, Lord. What do you want me to do? Two sentences, really simple. No idea of what would be on the other side of it, but that wasn't the point. It was the bravery and the courage that he showed as a 12, 13-year-old boy to go, oh my goodness, God is calling my name and I'm going to answer. See, Samuel was serving Eli and he was serving God by helping out Eli, who was really old at the time, and he was turning blind. And after three times of being woken up in the middle of the night, Eli finally clicks on It's like, it must be God speaking to Samuel. See, Eli was the mediator. He was the priest. He was supposed to be the person who mediated between God and his people. And it really should have been Eli that recognized God's voice and recognized that it was God calling Samuel. It was his job. It was his job to recognize and then instruct people on how to respond to God's voice. And look, we can beat up on Eli and we can say, look, he really should have recognized it from the start. And if you continue on through the chapter, it does go on where God tells Samuel that Eli and his sons really haven't been doing their job properly. So yes, we could have been doing that. But I want to give a little grace to Eli because he was an old man who was almost blind, who was asleep in the middle of the night. I know if someone wakes me up in the middle of the night, I'm not like bang awake and alert and ready to, you know, solve world's problems and pick up on stuff. I'm going to give him a little bit of grace and say, you know what, maybe he couldn't connect the dots straight away. But you know what, eventually he did. And he instructed Samuel in how to answer. And you know what, this was probably the answer that Eli gave when he heard God's voice. I'm listening, God. I'm listening, Lord. What is it that you want me to do? In Romans chapter 10, the next couple of verses after that passage that we just read said, how then can they call on the one that they have not yet believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard of? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent. You know, as Christians, we have been sent. We were commissioned by God to make disciples of all nations, to make followers of Jesus, teaching them how to respond when they hear God call their name. Let's not be Christians who grow old in the faith and deaf to the word of God. Let's not grow old and stop recognizing when God is speaking. Let's make sure that we can be tuned in so that we can help others being tuned in as well, that we may be able to answer. I'm listening, Lord. 
What do you want me to do? If I could have the worship team up, that would be great. So we've found a couple of things in this passage. First off, that God's call is personal. It's not a hey you, it's specific. He calls our name. He knows us intimately and deeply. And he claims us as his own. God is no respecter of persons or earthly qualifications. The only qualification that you need to have is he who has ears, let him hear. And those who may not have ears, I believe that God doesn't just speak in a verbal voice. I believe that he can speak through all types of experiences. Really, if you can receive any impression, God can speak to you. God's voice isn't always heard and it's not always recognised. Sometimes in the midst of the night, it can be really hard to figure out what is going on. But that we may have an open heart, that we may want to respond and want to hear from Him. Let's tune our ears in. See, we can respond logically, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right way. And we can feel this tug on the inside and yet we can look in so many different places for the answer. Like Samuel responded and went to Eli. Logical response to that pull, logical response to that call, yet it wasn't quite the right one. But yet his fourth response, when he knew whose voice was calling him, was brave and it was courageous and it was full of faith. He had no idea what was on the other side of it, yet he still responded. We as humans have been called by God and Jesus Christ is the greatest of those calls, the greatest of that communication of God's love to us. Eli was a mediator. He was the one who was supposed to be able to hear and recognise God's voice and direct them in the right direction in how to respond. As Christians, we are now called priests. We are now called ministers of reconciliation. It is our mandate, it is our commission to help people recognise God's voice and teach them how to respond. It doesn't need to be perfect, but rather just a willing response. Exactly the way when God calls you and God speaks to you that you respond. I'm listening, God. What do you want me to do? So right here, today, you may have been hearing God's voice for years or maybe you've only heard it just recently, maybe just today. And there's been this tug and it's like your name has been called and your whole body is automatically shifted in that direction. And you're thinking, what is this? What, whose voice is that calling? Perhaps you've actually gone and investigated different things, different expressions of spirituality, different ways of materialism or relationships. You've, you've, ex- you've tried to grab a hold of something and it's like you've been turned away. It's like, no. No, I wasn't calling you. That wasn't me. That wasn't my voice. And so you've been left and you're like, what was that about? I'm here to tell you because I've been sent to say that that was the voice of God. And when you feel that, you respond by saying, I'm listening, God. What do you want me to do? So we're all going to close our eyes right now. We're going to close our eyes because I believe that there are people right here in this auditorium today that have heard God's voice call them. And maybe you now know that that's God's voice, yet you have not yet responded. Perhaps you're afraid and you've kind of been paralyzed and kind of just sitting there and you can hear it, but you don't know what to do about it. And perhaps some of us have just kind of clicked into what that is. If you want to respond, just as the book of Romans says, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you can be saved. 
you will be saved this morning. I want to offer that opportunity. If that's for you, if you are wanting to respond to God's voice calling your name this morning, if you'd like to raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.